What's going on, everybody? Drone out here with you. It is July 8th, 2021. Want to get some quick hitters today with the NHL Stanley Cup Finals, the NBA Finals, uh, some baseball talk, and I want to close it with some Nintendo Switch news and gaming news and stuff like that. So let's get into this real quick. The NHL Stanley Cup Finals, the Tampa Bay Lightning have defeated the Montreal Canadiens four games to one to be back-to-back -back champions. Now, I told you before in the last segment when we did this about a week and a half ago that I would have lost my ass taking the Boston Bruins in the East and the Colorado Avalanche in the West. Now, before we sit there and talk about Tampa Bay Lightning and their greatness and all of that, I really have to mention this again because I heard this a lot in some of the pre-games and some of the other games in the finals leading up to it, that Carey Price, they said he just didn't play that well in the Stanley Cup Finals. I don't know what you guys are seeing, because when I look at some of those games and I see you know the two on O's, the three on ones, the odd man rushes, just the impossible cross crease pass attempt saves, I thought Carey Price flat out stood on his head. And the other criticism I thought that was pretty interesting was of the Tampa Bay Lightning power play. Now I didn't see what happened in game five, I'm gonna be honest with you, because I knew it was over after the one nothing. It just seemed like it was gonna be. But Tampa Bay Lightning had two goals prior to that on the power play, prior to game five, I don't know if they ended up scoring another one. End up saying that the Tampa Bay Lightning power play has failed them, and it's a big concern. How is it a big concern? You're throwing pucks all the way across to Carey Price, and he's making some outstanding saves when he can. You're pretty much moving that puck on the power play between you know Kucherov and Stamkos and Sergachev and Hedman, and it just looks like a ping pong ball over there. It's absolutely incredible the puck movement that Tampa Bay gets on the power play, and they are to be feared of the utmost prospect. And I thought Carey Price was absolutely outstanding. I thought the Tampa Bay Lightning power play, regardless of not getting as many goals as they wanted to the finals, was still absolutely outstanding. Both teams were really good. And I don't know what those criticisms were. Or whether it was Eddie Olchek saying, oh, these guys got to get to the net more and shoot the puck more and do this and that. I don't know what you guys are seeing because that's what I was seeing the whole time there. And I get it on both sides of the fact that you know, Tampa may have like 20, 22 shots, and Montreal may have 15, 18. They're both really good defensive clubs, and they're going to try to take away space in the middle. Sometimes there will be some gaps here and there. You saw that mostly on the Montreal end, but what can you do? They don't have the same top-end talent that Tampa Bay has, bar none. That's really all there is to say about it. And even a hobbled Steven Stamkos within the last probably four or five seasons He's still out there. Nikita Kucherov is still out there, even coming back out of injury. You still got Braden Point and uh, Chernak and all these other guys out there. And uh, honestly, Andre Vasilevsky, you sit there and talk about how good Carey Price is. Vasilevsky, it seems like he didn't lose a damn game. He barely gives up any goals. I mean, I get the defensive core is really down in Tampa Bay, but it just seems to me, and I should have thought about this before, before I end up going picking Boston or wanting Washington to try to do something again, that Tampa Bay is just too damn good. And coming back on the home front of it, you get to realize, yeah, Steve Eisman's not there anymore, but it was Steve Eisman's team. He built all those guys. And a lot of those guys were late picks, including Kucherov and Vasilevsky. So... If you're going to bring anything to the home front here, too, know that Steve Eisenman in a few weeks, and we'll talk about it as we get closer. No, I'm not going to do a full uh, breakdown of the Red Wings draft or anything because we don't know where these kids are going to be until a couple of years down the road. But with Steve Eisenman having that many lottery tickets, that many picks to play with, you got to feel pretty good. And he's got to feel pretty good in the back of his mind knowing, damn, I built that team and they're dominating, and I want to do that same thing here in Detroit. Oh, and obviously don't mind all my hair loss, too. I start to lose everything as you turn 34, and I mean everything stops working. So, But yeah, it was a good Stanley Cup Finals, and yeah, I should have expected Tampa Bay Lightning to do the same thing, but I do want to give the Montreal Canadiens all kinds of credit. Yeah, I'm a little sad that I can't see the Stanley Cup, but to be able to come back down from 3-1 against the Toronto Maple Leafs and then beat a Vegas squad... It was very, very entertaining. And honestly, when you think about it, from a couple of years ago with Max Pacioretty now, because I can take a look as the season's over, but with Max Pacioretty going to Vegas, and in return, uh, Montreal getting Nick Suzuki, that looks pretty good for Montreal. Cole Caulfield, another piece to work with, that looks pretty good. 
Montreal's not going to be going anywhere. Yes, they're going to have to worry about getting a pass Toronto again and getting all that stuff done. And hopefully, for Ken Holland's sake, not for all of us here in Detroit, but for Ken Holland's sake, he's got to figure out what the hell he's going to do here at Edmonton. Because, yes, you have two of the top five players in the league pretty much, or if you want to say top ten, if you want to put Dreisaitl in there. But you have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. You need to get stuff done, because really all it is is Ethan Bear on defense there for Edmonton. So they got to figure that stuff out. But I would assume, in regards to that, Montreal will be back, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. And again, I know it's not a coming out party for Carey Price, because everybody knew how good he was. Yes, he's one of the few goalies that they still spend all that money on, because they assumingly don't give goalies that kind of money anymore. You'd rather spend that on a forward, let alone a defenseman, rather than a goalie. But still... Hell of a show there for Carey Price, hell of a show there for the Montreal Canadiens, and they should be very damn proud considering. And I don't want to see all that stuff on social media when I hear about the Montreal Canadiens saying, well, don't worry if we didn't win the cup because we got so many more than Tampa, and then Tampa clapping back and saying, well, yours are old enough to collect Social Security, and then I see something that the Dallas Cowboys mentioned, yeah, these MFers are spitting. Well, honestly, the Cowboys haven't won since, like, 95. <laughs> So I don't even know why they're chiming in. But still, it's good on both of those teams. It was really enjoyable. And more than I think about it, too, we talk about that trade between Montreal and Vegas and things like that from the year prior. It's one of those things now you look at Vegas, and I said, and I've been reminded of this before, even though I think Vegas probably has a couple more years, I've been reminded that it should be a lot more because it should be a free agent destination and all that. And a good GM will rework some of those contracts there for Vegas to try to get them to have the same level of top-tier talent. But when you have all that money put into Mark Stone, Max Pacioretty, Alex Petrangelo, you're going to start to get a little top-heavy. So it would be interesting to me to see next year, as we introduce the Seattle Kraken, what Vegas will do to stay top-heavy. Because they'd said with George McVie and all of that, they want to get it done within the first five years. This was year five. They lost to probably an inferior Montreal team, but you can't tell Montreal of that. And we'll see what happens. But this was a good NHL season. It'll be interesting to see what happens next year with Seattle cracking them. And that's only just a few more months away here, guys. And then, as I said, within a few weeks, we go into the NHL draft here for 2021, going into the 2022 season. We'll talk more hockey then later. And we'll see where everything goes, because I want to hit a little more Red Wings and stuff at the time when we get to that point. So, let's talk about it here a little bit with the NBA Finals. Yes, I'll make my pick tonight, and I'll make my pick for the NBA Finals and who's going to win it. In fact, I'll do that right now before we get into this uh, sub-controversy that I want to talk about. Uh, so, between the Milwaukee Bucks and the Phoenix Suns tonight... I do expect the Milwaukee Bucks to even it up one-to-one. -one. Now, there's been some talks that Giannis Antetokounmpo will play the five position. You know, Dario Saric is out for the Phoenix Suns. He's one of the guys that actually from the Philadelphia 76ers and the process. He's in the NBA Finals before him, Bede and Simmons and all that, but I digress. He's hurt now, which sucks for the Suns. But they expect Giannis to play at the five so you can pair him against DeAndre Ayton on defense, push Ayton out there a little bit, and try to give the Bucks a little bit more of an advantage. If the Bucks do want to win this game tonight, they got to get a little bit less turnovers here from Drew Holiday. you got to get a little more production there from Brook Lopez, getting stuff inside. Uh, that's where he plays well. You know, Mike Budenholzer and all of that, I, I haven't been on board of all of it. But it seems like the Milwaukee Bucks, the majority of the time, do lose game one in the series, and they find a way to make adjustments. On the other side, for me, for the Phoenix Suns and Chris Paul, Devin Booker, DeAndre, and Jay Crowder, all of that, a lot of depth on the Suns side, and still, I don't care how old Chris Paul is, I'd still take Chris Paul over any other point guard in this series right now. He's in the NBA Finals for a reason. Devin Booker can light it up in a hurry, and DeAndre has honestly been the best, best big man in the playoffs so far. And I honestly believe, as I told you guys before, even though the Phoenix Suns Lucked out on getting Devin Booker, even though they had, you know, Dragon Bender and Josh Jackson and some of these picks just blow up right in their face. They got Devin Booker, but you know what? To get DeAndre Ayton from the Luka Doncic deal and Trey Young and all that, they're certainly not regretting that. He's one of the best big men in the game right now. Even with Zion and DeAndre Ayton, DeAndre Ayton's not that far off. 
And I expect the Phoenix Suns to win this series. I'm going to say the Phoenix Suns win in six games. But I will say the Milwaukee Bucks even it up tonight. And I want to mention a couple things here. I know a lot of people don't care about this controversy. But I want to make this comment. And I don't want to make it too political or make it anything to be like a racist argument or token thing like that. But I have to just talk about this here. So Rachel Nichols, you know she's the NBA analyst and the jump and all that. She's got her own show. She's been doing stuff since the 2004 finals with the Lakers and the Detroit Pistons. She always talks about the 2004 team being special, which is always near and dear to my heart than anyone else in Michigan, along with the Pistons, and you love all that. But she's been with ESPN and working all that stuff in ABC for a long time. And Maria Taylor has also been on ESPN for a long time. Since 2013, you know, she does a lot of college football coverage, and she began hosting NBA Countdown in 19. This is from an ESPN article from Ben Pickman from about five hours ago. And Maria Taylor is telling Rachel Nichols to remember to lift as you climb. All this controversy here. Well, let's get to it quickly here. This is stemming from a couple weeks ago. So Rachel Nichols has been doing a lot of the sideline reporting for the NBA playoffs and all of that. As mentioned, she feels like she should be getting the NBA Finals coverage. And she was a little bit upset in the fact that Maria Taylor, who happens to be black, and I don't want to sit there and talk about all these colors and this and that, but she's getting the job and all over that. She feels maybe she's a little less qualified. I'm not saying Rachel's saying that, but maybe that's where this ends up stemming to be because Rachel's been there a hell of a lot longer. So now, Maria Taylor is going to get that job to be able to cover stuff in the NBA Finals. And quite understandably, I don't understand why a lot of you guys don't feel this way, but quite understandably, Rachel Nichols is a little pissed. And she ended up commenting about that. And she said before that if you feel bad about ESPN, if ESPN feels bad about the way they treat their other employees and not having a good diversity record, give her more stuff to do. That's your own fault for having a crappy long time record on diversity. And Rachel Nichols went on to comment and said, I would know a, lot of th know a lot of things about that being a female reporter and having to deal with all of that. And frankly, a lot of the female reporters I had to work with on the Oakland Press, and a lot of my friends, I would know a lot of all about that too, because you don't get all the same opportunities and things like that. So I can understand that from the female side of that perspective for Rachel Nichols as well. So if you're feeling pressure about it, you know, find her and give her some other jobs and things to do, but don't take it away from me. And I totally understand where Rachel's coming from on this, and that's not because I'm white and commenting on all this stuff. You can understand, she's been a long-time senior member, and compared to where Maria Taylor's going to be, she wants to be able to keep that job. And then, you know, a couple days ago, within a week ago, Rachel has to apologize for saying, oh, she didn't mean to tear her the other workers down and she apologized for all this other stuff. Well, you know what? Honestly, Rachel Nichols shouldn't have to apologize for anything because she didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> she didn't do anything wrong. So I'm sorry. I'm, uh, you know, Maria Taylor is going to get her job and get a chance to do everything and she wants to make more money and understandably as she should. She's making a million dollars a year right now for ESPN. She wants to get closer to five. That's what ESPN's offering. She wants to get closer to eight. You know, she's going to get her chance to do all that stuff, but you know what? Honestly, I'll, I'll say this from my own perspective here, right? I know it's just high school sports and all that stuff and maybe a couple of occasional things in college. So being able to cover high school sports and all that stuff was a lot of fun, especially at the Oakland Press and doing all that stuff. And I was able to do a little bit for the Oakland Post here and there as a guest analyst or whatever the hell you want to call it. So obviously all I could really do is write stories. You know, I can't really carry around the camera equipment and take all the pictures and do all that. Everybody needs to be a multimedia journalist. It'd be hard for me to do all of that stuff without having to have someone else around. And obviously, if you're a smaller company or any other company like that, it's all about the profit margin and the bottom line. And honestly, before I even get to that point, if I was good enough, I would still be working and doing all that stuff, but I'm not. That's just the way it is. I'm not good enough to fit into the world and all that stuff, and I couldn't get the job done, and that's on me. And I'm not going to sit here and say otherwise, because that's the freaking truth. But at the same time, in the end, if we have other people that you have to pay to be able to help me out, that doesn't help the company's bottom line, and they're not going to want to do that either. So I can understand them going in a different direction. So get it from my perspective. I understand the way that it feels to, you know, not have some of these opportunities. But at the same time, it's my own freaking fault. So in Rachel Nichols' case, it's not her fault at all. 
She's a senior member of ESPN. She's done a damn good job for ESPN for a long time. And quite frankly, I talked about it before. You know, with all of these shows between NFL Live and The Jump, and they don't have any NHL coverage, but now they're going to have it going to probably ESPN Plus because the NBC stuff is down, which is going to make me a little sad, honestly, because you wonder how they're going to screw that up. But ESPN... Especially since, I want to say, the George Floyd stuff normally make everything a little bit political. And have messages and this and that and this and that and this and that. Well, now they're trying to make everything a little bit political here for Rachel Nichols and making her apologize and do all that stuff, which I don't like. She's definitely a senior member. She's done a good job and she doesn't deserve to have that stuff being taken away just because of a skin color or something else like that and their poor diversity record, which she's right about. But if we really want to be honest about all that too, where the hell is Doris Burke? Because she's been there for a long, long time, probably a little bit longer than Rachel Nichols. I like Doris Burke. I like Rachel Nichols. They're probably the two best female employees there that cover basketball, for sure, for ESPN, and it's not even close. So ESPN wants to make this a little bit of a controversy. They want to get Rachel in trouble for all that stuff, but she really didn't do anything wrong. So I hate to see when all that stuff happens. And bottom line is... Whoever does the job the best should get that job, and whoever has been there long enough and doing the best job should be able to keep that job. That's just the way it is. I'm sorry about all these diversity hiring practices. I'm sorry about all these when you go to college, getting scholarships based off skin color or anything else like that, just because you have a certain skin color or just because you have a certain dialect that you should get some other kind of grants. Look, I get the United States and everything else, and this is a tangent here, haven't always treated everybody so fairly in terms of the culture of melting pot and all of that. But it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world at the end of the day. That's how it's always been. You're able to get to where you're supposed to be because you worked hard and you earned that opportunity. And that's like how I would always want it to be. I'm sorry, sometimes it isn't fair for other people. But if you do a damn good job and you've done everything correctly and you lose it because of a reason like that, I, I don't feel too happy about that, and I honestly don't blame Rachel about it. So what do you think? Facebook.com slash Singer, Twitter, at John Ryan Ott. I would welcome your comments. And honestly, if we can keep everything from being too uh, crazy about that in the end, just give me your honest arguments and assessments about it, because I feel like we would all be on the same page if we had a rational discussion about it. So quick Tigers news here. MLB news, we get into it for the Tigers. They've been playing pretty damn well, honestly. And when you're going through the back end of the schedule, you go from Texas to Minnesota to KC back to Minnesota, and you're thinking the Tigers have a chance to win some games here. They're definitely playing above 500 since the last month, and they're playing well. Now, this is from Evan Petzold of the Detroit Free Press. The Detroit Tigers began limiting KC Mai's innings, and here's the plan moving forward. So pretty much, A.J. Hinch, because I was looking into it, I'm saying, why is KC Mai's only pitching three, four innings? Well, we're getting close to the end of the season here, and A.J. Hinch pretty much just squashed all those rumors, saying we want to just limit the innings to make sure that the young pitching stays healthy and everything else is going well. So the trade deadline for the Tigers is going to be at the end of the month. And what's interesting to me and what the main story seems to be is what the hell is going on with Jonathan Scope. I know recently, within the last couple of games, he might have struggled a little bit. But yes, he did get a Player of the Month card on MLB 21 the show, which was nice to see. He's been playing very damn well for the Tigers. He's been one of the best hitters all season. Probably safe to say that Jonathan Scope won't be here going forward by the end of the month for the Detroit Tigers. But he's played damn well. But it also leads me to believe... As Sunday is going to be the MLB All-Star Game, and this is going to be set in Colorado. This is also the first time that the MLB Draft is going to be on the same day as the All-Star Game and stuff like that. So, talking about this here, coming into the draft, the Tigers are going to have the third pick, I believe. So, they're going to have a chance to get one of the top two pitchers here in Vanderbilt, if they want to go that way, if they want to go to that place. So Al Leiter, you know about his son Jack, he's probably going to be one of the top picks in the MLB draft. But I've been hearing about this name for a long, long time, especially going back to the Oakland Press days, some of my bosses, and Kumar Rocker for Vanderbilt. Now the Tigers are expected to 
possibly get this guy because he's going to fall somewhere between the top five. And the Tigers could add yet another pitcher of high caliber to the point where they're saying that he has more upside than Casey Mize, who of recent stature between Casey Mize within his last full starts, that, damn, he's been really good. So you're telling me the Tigers could add another pitcher on top of that? Already going from Scooble, Mize, Manning, Kumar Rocker, Spencer Trimble, all the stuff that they already have. And you can say what you want, that the Tigers need to add more hitting. You already got Spencer Torkelson and you have Riley Green coming. Probably sometime next year. But yes, you always want to have bats. And yes, if you're an advocate like me, you would want to have bats that particularly pertain to the outfield. And also be more of a five-tool player in the outfield. Look, I understand not everybody can be Mookie Betts or Mike Trout, but I'm going to be liking what I probably see from Riley Green because it seems to be he's going to be close to be a five-tool player. But as we get back to it here, if the Tigers do add Kumar Rocker to their already solid pitching staff, it leads me to believe that the Tigers can feel like, and I'm not sitting here proclaiming this right now, I'm not. But if the Tigers can get to that point where they have some of these guys like Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, Rick Porcello, Anibal Sanchez, David Price, it's going to be amazing. You know, Doug Fisker, you want to throw that in there? It would be amazing to have all of those guys, and I'm talking about Turnbull, My, Scooble, Manning, uh, Kumar Rocker, potentially top five, or however you want to throw that in there, that these guys would also be under the Tigers' control for a long time, and they wouldn't cost you any money because they're all recent draft picks, or in maybe Rocker's case, soon to be Tigers' draft pick. That you can have that pitching staff from hell, at least a four-headed monster, while you're working on, or maybe a three-headed monster. Maybe Turnbull, you don't consider that in that point, but he's also thrown a no-hitter. But you also say there's been a million no-hitters thrown in MLB, but still. You could have that pitching staff and potentially not have to pay them any money. And then also by 2024, have all the Miguel Cabrera money come off the books. The Tigers pretty soon will have a lot of money to spend. And quite frankly, they probably already have some money to spend within the next coming years. If they want to go ahead and bring in some primo free agents, or they want to just get some other building blocks to put aside the pieces that they already have, Tigers probably by 2023 could be sniffing a playoff spot. It seems like the rebuild is going pretty well. I'm not saying they will, but by 2024 you would certainly expect this team to be wholeheartedly competitive because right now, and it goes without saying, that A.J. Hinch wouldn't be here without that scandal and everything else that went on in Houston. Tigers were really, really lucky to get him despite all my thought processes and the fact that I didn't want a guy like this to be in Detroit, and I was a little worried about all that stuff, A.J. Hinch has already proven his value, and he's made this team better than they already should be. That's part of it. And yes, I know he's got more tools to play with as far as upcoming budding talent, but still, this Tigers team is better than what their parts are right now. And he's a large reason for that. You know, Not to mention that suicide squeeze play against the Houston Astros, which was really damn nice, I know it's all on Grossman and Badu and everything else to execute all that stuff, but still, it looks pretty good, and A.J. Hinch has done a good job. And yes, coming within the next couple of years, the Tigers will have some talent to play with. Will they add Kumar Rocker? We'll find that out on Sunday. And we'll probably hit you back up here in the next couple of weeks, or at least another week and a half, to talk about more sports and more news and all of that stuff as well. But what do you think? Facebook.com slash Gunslinger. What do you think about the MLB season? What do you think about Jacob deGrom staying home, rest, resting in recovery? Uh, Carlos Correa, Jose Altuve also doing that as noted today as well. They will not be participating in Sunday's All-Star game. So let's get into this one last topic here. There's been some gaming news on the recent front, and a lot of that has not been good. Whether you're still trying to procure a Series X, a Series S from the Microsoft side, a PlayStation 5 with or without a disk drive, I know that's been tough, whether it's StockX or eBay or things like that. As I mentioned before in the previous videos, and I could link those, but if you really wanted to look at it, I can show you how I got a PS5 and all of that stuff. But 
as we talk about whether it's the Ford Bronco, the cars, whether it's computers, whether it's consoles or anything else, if you don't have those semiconductor chips, if you don't have the things available, it's really hard to get everything else in front of you. And that's how it's always been. But now the worst part, if you wanted to get a, a Microsoft console between the Xbox One, the Xbox One X that's been discontinued, or the S, or a PS4 or a PS4 Pro, even that stuff is hard to find. That's pretty much going the way of the dodo bird right now. But yet, on October 8th, of this year and retailing at $349 it's the Nintendo Switch OLED model and yes I was talking with my friend Steve that I used to work with here at Hanson hopefully get a chance to talk with him a little bit more as we go along the lines and things start to slow down a little bit this is the Nintendo Switch model and him and I <laughs> had some of these discussions and I do want to know your thoughts on this as well who is this for? So this Nintendo Switch model, rather than being $299, will retail MSRP for $349. And this is just a Nintendo Switch with an OLED screen, a 7-inch OLED screen. So yes, it's going to look a little, bit, a little bit better in portable mode, a little bit shinier on the screen. But the thing is, for $349, I know it's just another $50 or whatever, but at the same time, there is no spec upgrade from this OLED model from the previous Nintendo Switch. So you have an OLED model Nintendo Switch now for portable side. So that's just for portable side. If you're still docking it and everything else, it's the same specs, same everything else from the original Nintendo Switch. And then you also have the very curious from last year, the Nintendo Switch Lite. That is just a Nintendo Switch that doesn't switch. You can't use it on a TV. It's just the handheld model. So honestly, I wonder again, for $349, what's this OLED model? Who's it for? Because yes, you might have a LAN port that's not wired, and you might have 64 gigabytes of internal storage, or maybe a little bit better speakers inside the Nintendo Switch handheld model, but it doesn't change the fact that it's still the same graphics and still the same processor, RAM, setup, everything else that the original Nintendo Switch was. So I'm really wondering who the hell this is for. And to be honest with you guys, think about it like this. Uh, look, I understand the Series S would be the same price pretty much. So you can get a Series S for about 400 or 350 or 250 Let me look at this right now before I end up talking on my ass. Let me see right now what the Series S price is. Because I know I had this before initially when I did the price model. So, okay, $400 for a Series S. So I was right initially, $400 again. So this is $350. So for $50 bucks more, I understand it doesn't have the same specs as the Series X, but you can get a not quite 4K console, but definitely a lot more specs, but you also have that same processor that's inside of the Series X, pretty much the same kind of processor that's inside of PS5 for $50 more, and also get access to the you know Xbox Game Pass and things like that. For $50 bucks more, or honestly, guys, pretty much a hundred bucks more. You can just get a PS5 or a Series X with all the bells and whistles, and you can get a full next-gen experience. Or you know, spend a hundred dollars less and get the same Nintendo Switch model you already had. So honestly, I wonder who the hell it's for. And when we talked about it, and I thought about this too, and he's right. And quite frankly, I think a lot of you that think about this are probably right. Look, I understand <clears throat> that a lot of us think about this too. The Nintendo, I know all that stuff doesn't lose value. When you have your awesome first party games, whether it's Mario or spin offs between the Yoshi or Metroid or Zelda or things like that, the list goes on and on and on for Nintendo. And things are always great. And they don't lose value. And the exclusives in the first party games are always great. That's understandable. That goes without saying. But at the same time, Nintendo also knows that this stuff is going to fly off the shelf like hotcakes. So really, they don't need to price anything down because they know people are going to still buy it. And yes, in my aspect of it, when you think about it years and years ago now, when the Nintendo DS launched, and then you went from the Nintendo DS to the Nintendo DS Lite, I may argue I bought a Nintendo DS Lite because I thought it was essential. Because no, you shouldn't be launching a handheld console without a backlight. No, I didn't buy a Nintendo DS. I did play a Nintendo DS a lot, but I did buy a DS Lite because you need a console with a backlight. So I thought that was essential. But at the same time, my point being is the fact that Nintendo has made a lot of those handheld consoles 
or just some minor adjustments. And you could say the same same thing with the PSP Go, you know, stuff like that. But at the same time, when I got to think about it, and I know Sony didn't have a long line, even though I loved the PSP. I thought it was the greatest handheld console of all time, not to mention all of the modding you could do with it, and all the lovely things that you could do with the PSP, even though the handheld memory and all that stuff was a piece of shit. It sucked having to pay a lot more for the handheld memory because Sony didn't have their own proprietary. They had their own. Sony had their own proprietary cards. Excuse me. So it cost a little bit more. But each iteration between that PSP, I'm not going to count the go there. But from the PSP to the Vita, that was a significant step up. And now you have a third Nintendo Switch that hasn't even included one single spec increase in terms of the graphics and RAM and processor, so honestly, I wonder who the hell it's for. Now, I will be honest with you, as I said, when I was young, I had an NES, and I had a Sega that my grandma bought for me, but I was too young to realize what games were good. I was 10, and when I was 10, I got a PlayStation. I consider that my first console. I'm going to give me a PlayStation. I was old enough to know which games were good. So, it's been a long time from the NES to the GameCube. That's the last time I owned a Nintendo console that was actually a home console. And yes, the Switch is both, but I will consider it to be a home console because yes, you can play it on your TV. It's not just handheld. So I would count the Switch as a home console, even though it can do both. But it's been a long time from GameCube, from the $99 GameCube with the inclusion of Metroid Prime, and having the Nintendo GameCube being one of those consoles, and I can't believe I'm saying this, that was geared toward adults at the very beginning, because you had Resident Evil Eternal Darkness being one of the only ones at the time that were GameCube exclusive, and that was pretty damn cool. So going from Resident Evil Remake, which is one of the greatest remakes of all time, and I'm not even saying that as a Resident Evil fan, it's just the truth. Between the Resident Evil Remake and now Resident Evil 2 that we got a few years ago, you can't do much better as far as remakes are concerned. But at that time for the GameCube, it was Resident Evil Remake, it was Resident Evil Zero that was supposed to be on Nintendo 64, that was now made for the GameCube, and Resident Evil 4 at the time, which was GameCube exclusive, and then Eternal Darkness, you couldn't do much better if you were a survival horror fan, and the GameCube was a must-own. In fact, the first games I think I rented there when my cousin brought over his GameCube was Resident Evil Remake and NHL Hits 2002, which was absolutely incredible. NHL Hits was a wonderful franchise, and it's a shame that Midway isn't making those games anymore because you think about those cutthroat sports games in between NHL Hits, MLB Slugfest, uh, Red Card, uh, if you want to include the NBA Street at the time, that was a lot of fun, even though I know that was EA and stuff like that. But between NHL hits and uh, Blitz, NFL Blitz, stuff like that, that was really cool. So, my point being, it's been a long time since I've owned a Nintendo console. I want, I'm going to be honest with you, I have a PS5, but I want a Nintendo Switch. I've been waiting a long time for a Nintendo Switch. Look, I know they've been out for years already. It's been about four years for the Nintendo Switch, coming pretty close. But there's been lots of rumors, and all they've been right now is rumors, and everything else has been squashed here from Nintendo. And look, again, we understand that everything else is going to be flying off the shelves no matter what. But a lot of us are looking, myself included, for an upgraded Nintendo Switch, and we want one. This OLED model is not what we want. Even for people that already have a Nintendo Switch, I know a lot of you are considering upgrading. If the Nintendo Switch comes with the correct specs and all that stuff and the RAM and processing and all that, you will upgrade. You want a 4K, you're probably not getting 4K in handheld mode, but you do want a 4K dock mode in Nintendo Switch, and I don't blame you. And also, from a couple of years from now, maybe the TVs at this point will honestly be 4K ready. And maybe it might take to the point to where we get to a PS5 Pro or a Series X Pro, or whatever you want to call it, whatever the new iteration will be, because yes, we know that will be coming down the horizon. Maybe at that point in two or three years when that comes down, these TVs will be finally be ready 
to be able to have gaming and everything else done. And look, I don't blame all the TV manufacturers because TVs were only meant to be for one thing, watching TV. But now all the stuff with the bigger screens and everything else being cheaper at the same time, you want to have a good gaming TV and you're waiting for all that stuff to come out. Maybe the Nintendo Switch and the upgraded Switch will release by the time a new, a new good gaming TV comes out. Because right now, like I said, I'm still using that Panasonic Vera 42 inch from about 13 years ago. An Xbox 360 TV, I like to call it, from Resident Evil 5, I'm still using the same thing. All I ever bought that was nice was a soundbar to go with this PS5. And it's not a gluttony thing, right? As I've said, I've been waiting for this PS5 for a couple of years. And we all knew the PS4 and everything else was coming out a little underpowered. So I was saving, I was getting those GameStop coupons, all that stuff, all settled. Money all settled. So all told, with an extra controller and uh, Demon Souls and Spider-Man and NBA 2K21 at the time, all that cost me the same retail price with the console of $500 with all that combined. So it really wasn't nothing to me at that point because it's the same retail, retail price of the console with an extra controller and three games. I was ready for it. That was a good price point for me, and I was happy with all of that stuff. But with this Nintendo Switch, I'm looking at this at a $349 price point with no major upgrades there besides just a shinier looking screen in handheld mode. And I'm wondering who it's for. But as always, let me know what you think. Facebook.com slash TV Guns here Twitter at John Ryan Ott. This is the July 8th show of 2021. This has been a little bit of a quick hitter. As always, we will get back to you soon. I'm going to try to make this a uh, quicker show as I talked about in terms of coming back to you. So probably at least within a week and a half or two weeks, I want to get back to doing this more and more as I mentioned before in the last show that I did. So we're going to keep doing this. and We're going to keep talking about some other things and uh, trying to find some other news on the table. So it's one of those things where maybe I'll find some things that I want to talk about. Maybe I'll find some things that I want to share with you and all of that. Hopefully there isn't just some news for the sake of news. If it's a little bit of something that's passionate to me, I'm going to talk about it and leave my thoughts. And if you want to get in and discuss, always Facebook.com slash TV Gunslinger, Twitter, at John Raynott. If not, no problem. All this stuff's going to be posted anyway. But I appreciate you checking it out. Talk to you soon.